Hello there. Have you ever watched a movie that made you question every little thing? Well, the Carnival of Souls seemed to do just that for me. This movie was made by only six people actually, including the director himself. And as far as I know, the main actress, Candace Hillegas, was not included in that number to think this movie was made with only $30,000. This low budget horror movie. Which equals to about $236,000 today. You know, as of 2016. But man. This movie was an inspiration to make The Night of the Living Dead in 1964. Which was the movie that started the zombie craze. How? Why? Well, Let's go and take a look at the story and see if we can grab a lot of those answers. This being a carnival of souls. So the movie begins where a group of males in this car ask this group of females if they want to drag race. Now, unlike any other movie, this one begins quite abruptly, which is actually really freaking cool. Now what I don't understand is why this happens. Did I miss something? No, I'm being serious here. At first glance, it just looks like she screamed from being scared of the drag race. Startles her friend driving the car, and then they go off the bridge to their deaths. But she didn't scream before her throughout the whole drag race, so why now? Even to the point where they are on the bridge for a good while. If you watch it again, but in slow motion, you notice that the other car didn't push them off the edge either. Is it me, or does this not make a whole lot of sense? Not trying to nitpick the movie here, but I'm just curious if I'm the only one thinking this way. Alright, here goes. We overhear a guy saying, They might not ever find the car, and another guy who states that, With the current, we might not even ever find that car. When he's talking to the sheriff. Um, the current isn't that strong from what I can tell, and... Why don't the car just sink? I doubt the car would move very far considering the weight of the car and the strength of the river and even how long the car has already been sitting at said the bottom of the river. I know that technology is nowhere near it is today, back in the 60s and all, but how do you lose a car in these circumstances? If anyone could tell me more or can give me your opinion, I'd love to hear it. Okay, sorry, I'm done being super analytical over the small things that really don't matter in the grand scheme of this movie. Cause this movie is really great. I just want to point that out, that's all. So this girl named Mary Henry comes walking out of the river and the rescue workers help her get back to society. Not even really questioning how she was able to stay underwater for so long. And neither should you. She looks to be quite away from the world when walking up that hill. The mud and or makeup is done really well here too. Now, for those who normally don't watch my movie reviews, I am going to be spoiling the entire story of the Carnival of Souls. 
So if you wanna go watch the movie, now's the time to do so and come back and watch this later. If you don't mind it being spoiled, then by all means, continue watching and we'll get through the entire thing. Um, this movie is released and remastered on DVDs. It has special editions with tons of extra content with it of like interviews from the director, the actress and producers and all that kind of stuff. Um, there is even a colorized version of the film. Granted, I wouldn't recommend watching it because that's not how the movie was made or intended to be seen because it loses the atmospheric tension. You don't have that feeling you would normally have with the colorized version. And I've mentioned this in my last Man on Earth review too, so. I mean, you can if you want, you can watch it online for free. The quality's nowhere near as it is like on a DVD, but you know, it, it's there. All that being said, let's continue with the Carnival of Souls. So afterwards, Mary returns to the bridge, lost in her own mind. Probably thinking about what happened to her friends and if they'll ever find that car. And then we kept to her playing a giant organ. I've been to many churches and I have never seen an organ of this size before. Don't get me wrong, it's beautiful, but damn, that's one big organ. <clears throat> so Mary is quite the organ player herself. Her boss comes up and tells her she'll be playing a similar organ in a church down in Utah since that is where she is moving. But then he makes the comment. Are you driving by Benton to see your folks? No, I can't. I, I, I must hurry. I, I, I've got to leave. I'm going to drive straight through. Mary, it takes more than intellect to be a musician. Put your soul into it a little. Okay? Put your soul into it? Is this some kind of foreshadowing? Well, then she leaves and never comes back. I can't say I'd blame her. I'd get bored working in a place like this. It's either you are building something or playing an organ doesn't seem like there is anything else to do. Now, this is where the movie really builds on the atmosphere and makes you think. I'm going to show you the next scene of her driving to Utah by herself before I talk about it. So here, go and take a look and I'll add text on where you can skip it if you just want to get back to me talking. So, as we can tell, there is a spirit that is following her. Is he one from the river? Or is he here to bring her back to the dead? Mary ends up asking a gas station attendant about an abandoned building that she saw upon driving into Utah. It used to be a carnival of some sorts. Upon getting situated at her new home, she goes to the church and begins to get comfortable in her new job. We do get to see the same spirit, which lets us know he followed her from the road all the way to the church, but for me this is where the movie starts to slow down for a while before giving the audience any more answers. I mean, I don't mind Mary playing the organ and all the symbolism, but it's the new love interest that really bothers me we get introduced to some guy named Joe Lynn also known as Mr. Linden he's uh, he's a typical sleazeball whose only gain is to pick up pretty girls he comes across as self-centered while Mary is of course in and out of focus with herself 
For someone who may or may not be dead, the conversations come across as not that interesting between the two. I understand we need character development and need to move the story forward, but it feels more forced and awkward more than anything. I would have preferred if these sections were cut and replaced with development from the world of the dead and the passing of souls with characters who instead understand what this connection is. So, the wandering phantom figure followed her all the way to the, her house, however, upon the first time, he doesn't do anything, like at all. I mean, this is a nice jump scare and builds great atmospheric tension, but the scene fails to follow up on what it gave us, other than making Mary seem paranoid or crazy. Hmm. It seems I'm critiquing this movie more than praising it like I thought I would. I mean, it's no Last Man on Earth with Vincent Price from 1964 or anything. It's just the scenes in the house don't click with me like they did with a mass majority of audiences back in the day. Huh. I mean, don't get me wrong, this film is a masterpiece in and of itself, but the, the scenes just drag and they're boring watching this multiple times through. I mean, just the ones in the house. Eh, anyways, let, let, let us proceed. So, Mary has a nice chat with Mr. Linden, and we learn that she went to college to be an organist, and that Linden dropped out of school because he wanted to chase girls. Which pretty much sums up how these characters are excluding Mary possibly being dead at this point from the accident at the beginning of the movie. We at least know she is, or was, an extremely innocent young woman. Afterwards, we see her try on clothes inside of a clothing store or a shopping mall, and upon not liking the stuff she tries, everyone seems to be unable to notice her. My first time watching this, I assumed she was already dead, and that her interactions with the world of the living was all in her imagination. But upon rewatching this movie several times, I also conclude that since she is so close to the souls of the dead, that she is able to pass between the two worlds unknowingly. But it's really up for interpretation. Are a lot of souls? Yes, that is the movie I'm reviewing. Does it have clowns? Actually, no. It doesn't involve clowns, just souls. Oh, what a shame. Now, can you please leave? I have a review I'd like to finish. <sighs> Alright, sorry, where was I? So, after running to a park, she encounters a doctor who is willing to help her. He tends to be very direct with her in trying to get answers, but concludes that everything that is happening to her is up to her imagination. We figure out that Mary has no desire for love or attachments for other human beings. Keep that in mind for later. Now, Mary ends up going to the carnival right after in search of some answers. And for me, the visuals here are strong and very atmospheric. Just watch for yourself and you'll see what I'm talking about. Now the clip I'm about to show you is a little over 3 minutes long, so feel free to skip ahead if you do not want to see the whole thing.
Now, upon analyzing this scene, it seems like the souls at the carnival are still there. I love the shot of Mary walking down the tunnel because it seems she's going down one way and is not going to be able to come back and that her life is twisting and turning. At least that's how I look at it. And then there's another shot of like a mattress going down a slide. That's also one of my favorites. Because to me it feels like kids are sliding down the mattress. At least the souls of children. And lastly we have one where she throws a rock into the lake. And then we see the soul of the phantom figure that's been following her throughout the movie. Did he die at the carnival perhaps? Hmm. Mary returns home after a long day, only to be encountered by the sleazeball, <laughs> oh sorry, I mean Mr. Linden. He invites her dancing, and she just doesn't want to be alone. Alright, fine. Doesn't mean I have to like this character anyways. But immediately afterwards, Mary heads to church and becomes, well, um, see for yourself. Profane, sacrilege, what are you playing in this church? Have you no respect? Do you feel no reverence? And I feel sorry for you and your lack of soul. This organ, the music of this church, these things have meaning and significance to us. I assume they did to you. 
But without this awareness, I'm afraid you cannot be our organist. In conscience, I must ask you to resign. Apparently, the music she was playing was sacrilege? Seriously? To me, it was very enchanting and more intriguing than anything else. It makes me feel like I'm drifting off somewhere, or not the most pleasant of people stay, or perhaps the victims or lost souls stay at. Either way, the music score is phenomenal in this scene, and I love this movie for having scenes like this. When I analyze this scene from a filmmaker's perspective, I can appreciate where the director is going with it. Her mind and soul is being sucked away back to this carnival, where the souls of the unrest are at. Calling her. Were these souls victims in a carnival accident, or perhaps part of a satanic group? Well, let's keep watching and find out. So next, we see Lyndon taking her to a club. Mary isn't interested in dancing, and instead of being alone, she agrees to go back to his place. But the souls do not stop calling her. The soul of the unnamed man comes back for her, and she freaks out. Lyndon decides she's batshit crazy and books it. Now, Mary finds herself having nothing left anymore and goes to where the souls are calling her. The carnival. So there is clowns at the carnival. What? No, I said the souls are calling her, not the clowns. Where do you get that from? Then why is the movie called The Carnival of Souls? Because there are souls there not clowns. The souls of clowns? No! The movie isn't called The Carnival of Clowns. Now, go away, I'm trying to finish a movie review here. Then why don't we make a movie with clowns? It'll be fun! <sighs> I already have films and stuff planned with clowns. Now do us all a favor and beat it. Go back to your little room where you have fun with your toys. My. My toys? You do know I'm a little bit crazy, right? <sighs> okay, I lied. I'm really crazy. <laughs> Leave. Now. Ah, uh, you are no fun. I'll be back, though. Sorry about that. Let's get on with the finale of the movie. So upon making her way to the carnival, she seems to go in and out of what I like to call the spirit world, because she sees a bus full of souls, and then no one can see or interact with her. But she wakes up back in the car. Can we conclude that this was a dream, or a otherworldly connection? I enjoy how the movie leaves a lot of it up for interpretation, but at the same time, I wish it gave us more answers. It's not long before Mary makes it back to the carnival, where she sees the souls dance on the ball, but then they suddenly notice her and chase her back to the beach, where they feast upon her soul and take her to join them in whatever they seem to be doing. Overall, it's a great finale. Very ominous, much left for us to analyze, and overall very well made. So after Mary is taken by the souls, we see the doctor, priest, and a police officer examine what happened, but can't seem to piece it all together. Next, Mary's body is found inside of the car this entire time. It seems she had an effect on the people around her, but she's been dead this whole time. From the way I see it, her soul was wandering, and it's how she was able to interact with the world of the living on and off. But why do the souls of the carnival want her? What is her connection to them? What is their goal? Who is Mary really? I don't mind a movie challenging me to think so heavily about its subject matter, but I also expected more. It's okay to leave the viewer questioning and talking about your film, but this is a movie that leaves me more empty than satisfied. Overall, it's a really great film and a classic for its time, don't get me wrong. But no matter the film, the audience should at least have a couple more answers. And perhaps a better ending. Finally done, eh? 
Well, I am done with your shit and your shitty movie for alienating clowns. Whoa, whoa, hold on. Okay, this movie has nothing against clowns. It just has nothing to do with them. That's all. Well, I brought this knife out here and I'm dying to test it out. <laughs> It'd be a shame if the trip I came out here for came to a waste now, would it? Uh, <laughs> it seems I must be going now um, before I get cut up in the chopped liver and all. So um, have a great day, guys, and I'll catch you later. Where are you going, Patty Cake? It'll be okay. I just want to cut your arms off. <laughs> Ha 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 ha!